Yes. So a very good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Yes, so I am myself, Dr. Rajesh Guba. Welcome to this platform of RIS Medical Academy. And uh, this particular sessions we are conducting every day, that is the clinical based questions. So in order to see that you should not face any difficulty in your upcoming FMG exams, we at RIS Medical Academy have ensured that we should make the, your preparation to be very easy. So as a part of that initiative, from the general medicine point of view, I'm there in front of you to see that you should not face any problems when you are answering the clinical based scenarios, whatever you come across in your upcoming FMG exam. And not only the clinical based questions, like uh, we are seeing nowadays, many of the image based questions as well. So I will also be discussing the image-based questions which are required for your general medicine and as well as the clinical-based questions. So today's questions will be like on the neurology, the image-based questions will be on the neurology and the clinical-based questions will be on the pulmonology. So these are the two topics which we'll be covering today. And yes, now with this basic introduction, let me just go ahead and start with the session. So the first question, in the image given to you, which cranial nerve will be set, spared in the lesion shown below? Eighth cranial nerve, ninth cranial nerve, <coughs> tenth cranial nerve, twelfth cranial nerve. <coughs> So the question asked is spared, right? So first of all, based on the image which is given to you, you should be able to make out what is the lesion. So what it has shown, it has shown that this part of the brain is damaged, right? It's gone. So anyone? Okay, so we have one correct answer until now by Gangula Akansha. So can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis first? Diagnosis. Yes, Sai Tarni, can you tell me the diagnosis of this patient? What is the diagnosis? So diagnosis, what you need to remember here is, it is a case of lateral medullary syndrome. Right, it is a case of lateral medullary syndrome. And
right so yeah so now let me start back again so this is a case of right this is a case of lateral medullary syndrome all right this other name of this lateral medullary syndrome is it is also called as wallenberg syndrome right it is also called wallenberg syndrome now can anyone tell me what is the most vessel involved in wallenberg syndrome yes any one of you what is the vessel which is affected in wallenberg syndrome what is the vessel affected in wallenberg syndrome so the vessel which is being affected in the wallenberg syndrome is it includes any one of you so remember it is the vertebral artery which is most commonly affected and followed by the vertebral artery the next most common vessel affected in the for the development of lateral medullary syndrome is pica that is posterior inferior cerebellar artery right posterior inferior cerebellar artery okay so which cranial nerve will be spared in the lesion shown below now in case of lateral medullary syndrome the cranial nerves which are being affected is right the cranial nerves which are being affected is your 8 9 10 these are the cranial nerves that will be affected in the lateral medullary syndrome because these are the one which are present in the <coughs> lateral part of the medulla whereas you take the 12th cranial nerve that is hypoglossal this is present in the medial part of the medulla right this is the 12th cranial nerve is present in the medial part of the medulla so 12th cranial nerve involvement will be there in case of medial medullary syndrome all right so the 12th cranial nerve involvement will be there in case of medial medullary syndrome but not in case of lateral medullary syndrome and whatever the image which is shown to you you know whatever the image which is shown to you is the image showing involvement of lateral part of the medulla okay so yeah very good sai tarni so this 12th cranial nerve is the one which is a motor now for the tongue right it is it is the motor now for the tongue okay right now let me start with the i mean let me take up the next question yeah so this is a clinical based question a purely clinical based question and this is a clinical based question related to your uh, nephrology and as well as it also includes a part of your connective tissue disorders as well okay and let me see how many of you can answer this we have a 64 year old woman with type 1 diabetes mellitus to clinic with several months of the sinus problem <clears throat> right with several months of sinus problem and a four day history of oliguria so one positive complaint is sinus problem and the other positive complaint is oliguria her blood pressure is 137 by 80 which is normal the serum results show mildly elevated urea and as well as the creatinine so this is another positive problem raised urea and as well as creatinine and there is absence of anti glomerular basement membrane antibodies so anti glomerular basement membrane antibodies are completely absent and you take the cianca the cianca assay is positive and the rbc cast are present in the urine and her renal biopsy reveals glomerular crescents what is the most likely diagnosis in this patient 
post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis, good pasture syndrome, minimal change glomerulonephritis, Wegener's glomerulomatosis. Very good. So we already have the answer by Sai Tharuni. Excellent Sai Tharuni. So the point is, like, if Sianka is positive, right? If Sianka is positive, you need not require to think any other clinical diagnosis except for your Wegener's granulomatosis. But what will be the clinical manifestations in Wegener's granulomatosis? Wegener's granulomatosis, it is the one which is characterized by triad. Right, it is the one which is characterized by a triad. Now, what is that you will have within the triad? So, in the triad of Wegener's, you will have upper respiratory tract involvement, lower respiratory tract involvement, and as well as renal involvement. Right, upper respiratory tract involvement, lower respiratory tract involvement, and as well as the renal involvement. Now, how can you make out that there is upper respiratory tract involvement? The patient is having the sinus problem. So that tells that the individual is having upper respiratory tract involvement. And oliguria is there. That tells you that the individual is having renal involvement. But the very important point in the diagnosis of Wegener's granulomatosis is antibody. Which antibody is present? C. Anka is positive. That is very much suggestive of your Wegener's granulomatosis. And your vaginal granulomatosis, remember, it is a small vessel vasculitis. Right? It is a condition where you have a small vessel vasculitis. Okay? So that is about your vaginal granulomatosis. Now, regarding the other options also, I will try to tell you a few points. Hmm? Regarding other options, I will try to tell you a few points. Now, you take post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis. Post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis, it will present as nephritic syndrome, right? And it is most commonly seen in children, right? And the pathogenesis is molecular mimicry, right? Pathogenesis is molecular mimicry. So your post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis follows both skin and as well as throat infection, right? Now, we also have the involvement of the, uh, we also have the glomerulonephritis in adults as well. But in adults, the organism causing post-infectious glomerulonephritis will be staphylococcus. In adults, the organism is staphylococcus, right? Yeah. And the other important thing is uh, your post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis, it is a disorder which is characterized by deposition of immune complex. And what does this, where does this immune complex get deposited? This immune complex will get deposited within the glomerulus. And what does that immuno, uh, immune complexes contain? It contains C3 complement. So because the immune complexes which are getting deposited within the glomerulus contain C3, what will happen to your C3 levels within the serum or the plasma? So there will be low C3 levels. But this low C3, whatever you're having in case of post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis, this will be transient for one to two weeks. By again, this will be transient for one to two weeks. And again, within two to four weeks, it becomes absolutely normal the C3 levels, it becomes absolutely normal. So that these are some of the points related to your post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis. Now, now, after having discussed about the post-reptococcal glomerulonephritis, now let me tell you a few points related to your good pasture syndrome. So good pasture syndrome, this is also an autoimmune disease. Right? Now, antibodies, if you see, they are formed against Alpha three chain of alpha three chain of type four collagen, right? Alpha three chain of type four collagen, where these antibodies they are formed against the glomerular basement membrane, and they are also formed against the alveolar basement membrane. Now, because the antibodies are formed against the glomerular basement membrane they will present with hematuria. 
and antibodies they are also formed against alveolar basement membrane they will present with hemoptysis right and how do you treat these patients how do you treat good pasteur syndrome see first of all you should remove the existing antibodies for removal of the existing antibodies you need to do plasma pheresis right and at the same time you should also prevent new antibody formation right at the same time you should also prevent the new antibody formation so how will you prevent the new antibody formation that is by steroids and as well as azathioprine so steroids and as well as the azathioprine so these are the drugs which have to be given for uh, prevention of the new antibody formation otherwise how will you remove the existing antibodies by doing plasma pheresis so these are some of the very important points related to your good pasteur syndrome now you take the points related to your minimal change glomerulonephritis minimal change glomerulonephritis this is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children and as well as young adults right in children and as well as young adults and these patients they present with edema the child will present with edema and they will have selective proteinuria and what is that selective protein which is being lost that is albumin which is being lost <coughs> and these patients they have a very good prognosis right they have very good prognosis and what is the drug of choice in case of minimal change glomerulonephritis drug of choice is steroids right drug of choice is steroids and one point i should tell you is that renal biopsy picture light microscopy there will be no change seen in light microscopy there is no change seen in minimal change disease whereas you take in electron microscopy in electron microscopy you will have the fusion of the food process right in electron microscopy you will have the fusion of the food process okay right so this is about your the minimal change disease so but anyways what is the diagnosis of this clinical question which is given to you the diagnosis of this clinical question is the wegener's granulomatosis and why is that because the cnk is positive so that is the reason why the answer is b that is wegener's granulomatosis now we will move on to the next question yeah medial medullary syndrome leads to blockage of which of the following blood vessel so i have shown you the circle of willis so the image whatever is there is nothing but your circle of willis okay so i have given you the labeling also hmm? i have given you the labeling like this is your a b c and as well as d now tell me for an individual to develop medial medullary syndrome which vessel has to be blocked so for this so this is a question integrating anatomy and as well as general medicine right this is a question integrating anatomy and as well as general medicine so please answer this okay first of all you people tell me medial medullary syndrome is caused due to blockade of which vessel first you people tell me the vessel medial medullary syndrome is caused by blockade of which particular vessel so we have all the options covered some of you have answered a some of you have answered c and then d none of you have selected b anyone want to select for b yes none of you have selected b anyone want to opt b okay and can anyone tell me the vessel which is involved very good sandeep chandra so you have also selected b na 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 gangula akansha 
your pica that is posterior inferior cerebellar artery that is involved in lateral medullary syndrome not in case of medial medullary syndrome and medial medullary syndrome not medullary artery madhura rahul okay so medial medullary syndrome the involvement is the anterior spinal artery and what is your anterior spinal artery this is your anterior spinal artery so only one student answered that is sandeep chandra answered right very good sandeep chandra excellent so this is your anterior spinal artery right this is your anterior spinal artery okay so the answer is b now hmm? the answer is b now the other important thing is you should be able to label all the other vessels also you should know what are the other vessels also now what are the other vessels you see here what is given as here this is your d so what is your d? first of all what is that c which is joining this is your c which is given in your question what is c actually vertebral arteries <clears throat> both of these vertebral arteries we unite to form what is called the basilar artery both of the vertebral arteries will unite to form the basilar artery and your this is your d which is given in your labeling and what is the d that is ica that is anterior inferior cerebellar artery i don't know whether you are able to see the labeling or not right and then what is asked one second yeah so this is your ica anterior inferior cerebellar artery and your b is your anterior spinal artery then if you take your a a is your pica posterior inferior cerebellar artery right this is your pica posterior inferior cerebellar artery and this is what is involved in case of lateral medullary syndrome and your c which is given in your question that is nothing but your vertebral artery and vertebral artery involvement is also seen in case of lateral medullary syndrome but if anyone asks you question what is the vessel involved in lateral medullary syndrome in lateral medullary syndrome remember the vessel which is involved should be first answer should be vertebral artery then followed by that pica posterior inferior cerebellar artery as in medial medullary syndrome the vessel which is involved is anterior spinal artery right in medial medullary syndrome the vessel which is involved is the anterior spinal artery okay right <clears throat> so that is about like what is the vessel which is given in your labeling right so i hope everyone has understood this question any difficulty in this question to understand and as already i have mentioned you previously also in medial medullary syndrome the cranial nerve which is affected is the 12th cranial nerve right 12th cranial nerve okay right now we will move on to the next question <clears throat> right so this is a question with a uh, clinical base so this is a question related to your nephrology so we have a 68 year old obese asian man is seen in the hypertension clinic and if you take the blood pressure of the individual his blood pressure is slightly raised that is 151 by 93 and he suffers from poorly controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus so he is hypertensive and he is also diabetic blood results demonstrate elevated serum urea and as well as the creatinine an ultrasound scan shows asymmetry right asymmetry just one second i am sorry so okay right so an ultrasound scan shows the asymmetry between the two kidneys and on examination there is audible abdominal bruit or auscultated urine dipstick did not detect any blood or protein urine dipstick did not detect any blood or protein what is the best investigation ct angiography doppler ultrasonography abdominal x-ray renal arteriography 
renal biopsy. So what is that you want to do in this patient? What is the best investigation? But first of all, you people should tell me what is the diagnosis in this case? See, once you tell me the diagnosis, then I will tell you what is the best investigation that has to be done in this patient? Chronic kidney disease? Huh? No, no, no. no. <clears throat> Uh, no, I did not get the... Acha, Gangula Akansha. Like you have to select only one answer. It is not either D or A. You select either D or A, you select and tell me. Then I will tell you which, uh, whether you are correct or wrong. So please tell me the diagnosis. Any one of you? Right. So the very important point which will give me a diagnosis is the audible abdominal bruise. So this audible abdominal bruit is the one which gives me a diagnosis that the individual is having. Very good, Monica. Excellent. So the diagnosis of this patient is renal artery stenosis. Right? Renal artery stenosis. Now, now, what is the investigation with highest sensitivity in renal artery stenosis? The investigation with highest sensitivity in renal artery stenosis is renal arteriography. So renal arteriography is the investigation with highest sensitivity for renal artery stenosis, right? And some of you may think as Doppler ultrasonography. Doppler ultrasonography also can be done for renal artery stenosis. But the Doppler ultrasonography, if you see, the Doppler ultrasonography, it is least invasive. That is very much accepted, but the sensitivity is less. Sensitivity is less. Okay, so that is the reason why the best answer in this question is the renal arteriography. Now, what will be the presentation of a patient with the renal artery stenosis? The presentation of a patient with the renal artery stenosis will be hypertension. Now, why do they present with the hypertension? And that is because of activation of RAS. Right? That is because of activation of RAS. That is renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So because the RAS is activated, there will be more and more production of angiotensin 2 and there will be excessive production of aldosterone as well. So that is the reason why <coughs> the individual will have hypertension. So the presentation of this particular patient is hypertension in renal artery stenosis. So what will be the treatment in these patients that you need to do? And okay, the other point is, what will be the clinical presentation? Hypertension is like on examination, what will you have? Renal artery stenosis, clinical presentation is that they will present with recurrent pulmonary edema. Right, they will present with recurrent pulmonary edema. Right, so that is the important point that you need to remember. Okay, now how do you treat these patients? See, the treatment in these patients is right, the treatment in these patients is you need to do what is called PTRA. If the presentation is in the form of recurrent pulmonary edema, you need to do PTRA. What is PTRA? That is percutaneous transluminal renal angioplasty. That is what is the treatment for your renal artery stenosis, right? So, and one important drugs which are contraindicated in renal artery stenosis is, for example, if the patient has bilateral renal artery stenosis, can anyone tell me what are the drugs contraindicated in bilateral renal artery stenosis? What are the drugs contraindicated in bilateral renal artery stenosis? So remember this very important point, in bilateral renal artery stenosis, the AC inhibitors are contraindicated. Right? AC inhibitors are contraindicated. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are contraindicated in case of bilateral renal artery stenosis. So, this is a clinical question related to your renal artery stenosis. Right? Now, now so only, so what is the take home message now? The take home message from this question is that. If the individual is having audible abdominal bruit, you should suspect renal artery stenosis. 
that is the important take home message in this question okay right <clears throat> yeah <clears throat> all of the following layers are pierced by this needle except supraspinous ligament ligamentum flavum interspinous ligament ligamentum denticulatum see the question asked is except that means the question is asking you which of the following layer will not be pierced by this needle so first tell me what is this needle okay then what is the purpose of this needle and at the same time you should tell me what is the name of this needle <coughs> very good shabnam khan so yes now everyone is answering but please tell me what is the name of this needle and what is this needle used for <clears throat> so the purpose of this particular needle is for lumbar puncture right that is for lumbar puncture and the name of the needle <clears throat> this is called quinkies needle right this is called quinkies needle or we have another name called sprots needle right we have another name called sprots needle okay so this is the needle used for lumbar puncture right so all of the following now 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 we will come to the exact question now all of the following layers are pierced by this needle except now i will just show you the sequence now you see the sequence first the skin is pierced by this needle right and followed by that the supraspinous ligament then interspinous ligament then ligamentum flavum it does not pierce the ligamentum denticulatum it will pierce the ligamentum flavum then we pierce the dura mater then we enter into the place where the csf is present right then we enter into the place where the csf is present okay so this is about the layer which is not being pierced by this particular needle so the answer is ligamentum denticulatum <clears throat> right so i hope this question is clear now we will move ahead with the next important question okay so before going into the next question you should know what are the contraindications for lumbar puncture can anyone tell me what are the contraindications for lumbar puncture so the contraindications for lumbar puncture that include number 1 presence of any intracranial space occupying lesion if there is any large intracranial space occupying lesion please don't do lumbar puncture why because whenever there is a large intracranial space occupying lesion that will increase the intracranial pressure right so when you do a lumbar puncture in a clinical scenario where there is increased intracranial pressure that will cause herniation of the brain that will cause the herniation of the brain so please don't do lumbar puncture in a clinical scenario of intra raised intracranial pressure and next thing is if there is any local infection over the skin right if there is any local infection over the skin please don't do lumbar puncture now the other thing is can anyone tell me in which intercostal space sorry in, in in into which intervertebral space we will pierce the needle what is the site of lumbar puncture yes please tell me what is the site of lumbar puncture <clears throat> now the site of your lumbar puncture it is in between l3 and as well as l4 
Hmm? The site of the lumbar puncture is in between L3 and as well as L4. Right. Very good, Ceci Murugan. So it is in between L3 and L4. It is not L2, L3. It is not L4, L5. It is in between L3 and L4. That is the site where we do the lumbar puncture. Right. Next. <clears throat> Now, another point, tell me, whenever you do a lumbar puncture, how much of the CSF has to be drained? When you do a lumbar puncture, how much of the CSF has to be drained? So when you do a lumbar puncture, the quantity of the CSF that has to be drained is 20 ml. Right, the quantity of the CSF that has to be drained is 20 ml. Now, why, how, why do you drain 20 ml? This is required for various diagnostic purposes. And even, even the production of the CSF, right? Even the production of the CSF is also around 20 to 30 ml per hour. Right, even the production of the CSF is around 20 to 30 ml per hour, okay? So this is about the, <clears throat> Uh, in short, about lumbar puncture, right? Next. Yes. Now, no, no, no. We don't drain 60 ml. Gangula Akansha, we don't drain 60 ml. We drain around only 20 ml, <clears throat> right? Next. Yes, the next one is purely clinical based question and it's a very, very important question as well. And this is a question related to your nephrology. This is a question related to your nephrology. We have a 63 year old woman presence in accident and emergency with three, one second. Yeah, with a three day history. So with a three day history of worsening right with a three day history of worsening abdominal pain right and there will be also mild flank pain right there is also mild flank pain and examination reveals pain where in the suprapubic region pain in the suprapubic region. <clears throat> but otherwise, the abdomen is soft with no masses. The patient denies any other symptoms such as dysuria. That means there is no dysuria. But mentions she has had difficulty in passing the urine. So what is the problem? Difficulty in passing the urine in the last week and is only able to provide a small urine sample. which is odorous and bloody. She has no other medical problems, but admits to being long-term smoker. An ultrasound scan of the renal system is most likely to show. So please tell me the diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? <clears throat> yes, Sai Tarni, why did you tell bilateral hydronephrosis? And Shabnam Khan, Monica, why did you tell bilateral hydronephrosis? Please give the explanation for why you have answered bilateral hydronephrosis. I will say it is like bladder dilatation. Right. So now what are the positive points here? Right. What are the positive points? See, she's having a three day history of Achha, Sai Tarni, because difficulty in urination is there. That is why you want to tell bilateral hydro, hydronephrosis. Huh? You, even urethral stricture also can cause difficulty in urination, right? <clears throat> yes, Sandeep Chandra. Even there is urethral, even in urethral stricture also, the individual will have difficulty in urination. So why can't be difficulty uh, urethral stricture as the answer? Right. So now let me give you the explanation of this question. First important risk factor: what the patient has. The first important risk factor the patient has is long-term smoker. 
right long term smoker very good sai tarni you have uh, differentiated very nicely excellent good explanation right <clears throat> so the first important point is the individual is a long term smoker so in case of long term smokers like if you take the entire renal system starting all the way from the kidney and the renal pelvis and ureter and as well as the bladder and urethra this is lined by what is called transitional epithelium right this is lined by transitional epithelium and now if smoking agents if they exposed <clears throat> or if the transitional epithelium is exposed to the smoke remember this can undergo metaplasia and dysplasia right metaplasia and as well as dysplasia and later it can turn into malignancy right later it can turn into malignancy so smoking is a very very important risk factor here now so the point is why am i why should i see the answer as the bilateral hydronephrosis what am i suspecting in this patient number one abdominal pain is there where in the supra pubic region in the supra pubic region in the supra pubic region what is that you will have you will have the bladder in the supra pubic region uh, region when you palpate when you palpate you will have the bladder urinary bladder in the supra pubic region that means <clears throat> that means the individual has some problem or pathology pertaining to the bladder right pertaining to the bladder now what is that pathology related pertaining to the bladder that is your bladder malignancy that is bladder malignancy okay so this bladder malignancy whatever is there or whatever has developed this will obstruct the urinary outflow right this will obstruct the urinary outflow so once it obstruct the urinary outflow what will happen there will be back leak of the urine in both the kidneys when there is back leak of the urine in both the kidneys what will happen to the size of the both the kidneys the size of both the kidneys they are abnormally enlarged and that is what is called as bilateral hydronephrosis <clears throat> that is what is called as bilateral hydronephrosis okay so the entire story in this question what is a very very important point take home message long term smokers right long term smokers remember there is high chance of development of bladder malignancy that will cause obstruction of the urinary outflow that can cause bilateral hydronephrosis right now now the question is right you can ask me sir if there is urethral stricture right if there is urethral stricture then also the individual can have backflow of the urine causing bilateral hydronephrosis <clears throat> why not you are why is not the urethral stricture as the answer remember in urethral stricture they will not have the mild pain and that too in the flanks in urethral stricture they will have a very severe pain very very severe pain unbearable pain and not only that they are more prone for recurrent uti's urinary tract infection right so and our patient there is no dysuria at all our patient has no dysuria at all okay so that is the reason why you, your urethral stricture is ruled out <clears throat> right next now we will move on to the next question ha huh. this is very interesting question and let me see how many of you can answer <clears throat> 25 year old lady presented with complaint of night time bed wetting right and this entire story of night time bed wetting is there for past three consecutive nights and there is also stiffness in the legs for last few months and she reported her symptoms are worsened by physical exertion 
MRI head was performed. What is the correct statement? Presence of periventricular lesion, raised intracranial pressure, cortical atrophy, loss of corticomedullary differentiation. <clears throat> So what do you think is the answer being correct? Cortical atrophy, huh? no, no, no. It is not cortical atrophy. See, in case of cortical atrophy, what is the important marker in the MRI will be? You will have very deep gyra and sulci. And that is not there. So, your cortical atrophy is not the answer. Now, these are your ventricles, okay? These are your ventricles. Now, surrounding the ventricles, you see there are some lesions here. There are some white lesions which are here. Right? These are some white lesions which are present here. So, what is the answer here? The answer is presence of periventricular lesions. Hmm? The answer is presence of the periventricular lesions. So that is the answer to this particular question. But sir, okay, very good sir. There is presence of periventricular lesion. But what is the diagnosis of this case? This is a case of multiple sclerosis. So in case of multiple sclerosis, you will have the presence of small periventricular lesions. So, your multiple sclerosis, it is a demyelinating disorder. <clears throat> right, it is a demyelinating disorder, right? <clears throat> and what exactly is the shape of these particular lesions is, we give a characteristics name called Dawson's fingers. Right, we give a characteristic name called as Dawson's fingers. So that is characteristically seen in case of multiple sclerosis. And it is these lesions, that is the one which will explain the lesions which are present in the periventricular area. They are the one which will explain the bedwetting, right? They are the one which will explain the spasticity in the legs, right? They are the one which will explain the spasticity in the legs. So this is a classical case of the multiple sclerosis, okay? Right. Now, in case of multiple sclerosis, you should, in acute cases, right? In acute cases, what will be the drug of choice? The drug of choice for acute, Episodes of multiple sclerosis, you should give methylprednisolone. Right, you should give methylprednisolone. That is a drug of choice in acute events, acute episodes of multiple sclerosis. And multiple sclerosis, let me tell you, it is the one which is commonly seen in case of young females. It is the one which is commonly seen in case of young females. And the prognosis in multiple sclerosis is a poor prognosis. Right? They have very poor prognosis, multiple sclerosis. Okay? Right. Now, followed by that, we will see the next question. Yes. Now, this is a clinical-based question related to your pulmonology. So, question looks very lengthy, but the answer will be very simple. And these are the types of questions which you are going to get in your upcoming FMG exam. First of all, you should not get scared by seeing this particular lengthy questions. There is a first take home message. Please don't get scared. Please don't decide yourself that I cannot answer this question. Please don't decide. Develop some patience. Read the question once or twice. Then read the options thoroughly and then crack the question. Please don't be under the impression that it's a lengthy question, I cannot answer, we will skip off, please don't do that, right? Develop some patience in reading 
and understanding these type of lengthy questions also okay now first always in your clinical based question read the last line when you read the last line last line will give you an actual question what he wanted to ask and after that you read the upper story then you will understand it in a better manner okay right now let us see the question so first of all please don't get scared i'll just i'll explain you this question in a uh, very conceptual manner you need not worry at all okay so we have a 28 year old woman seeks a second opinion for asthma that has been worsening so what is the main complaint asthma and she has had asthma for past 14 years she is having asthma but over the past 6 months her symptoms have been more severe more severe since 6 months in addition to wheeze shortness of breath chest tightness she has she has had intermittent fever and flu like symptoms intermittently she has been treated with multiple courses of antibiotics as well as increasing doses of inhaled steroids with no significant improvement a chest x ray showed patchy bilobar infiltrates which are different which are in different locations from those seen on the x ray that has that she had 3 months ago serum aspergillus serologies are very high which of the following statements about this patient is false statement her serum eosinophil count is probably elevated a sputum culture for aspergillus is likely to be positive any bronchial involvement is likely to be on the surface only without tissue invasion fourth option she may need to be treated with systemic corticosteroids fifth option a trial of antifungal therapy will not be helpful yeah so now what is this uh, case first of all this is a case of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis right this is a case of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis so allergic so definitely yes eosinophil count will be elevated this is a correct statement what is the question asked about the question asked about is like what is a false statement okay right a sputum culture for aspergillus is likely to be positive yes that is also a correct statement any bronchial involvement is likely to be on the surface only without any tissue invasion let me tell you allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis they will have only bronchial involvement there will not have any deep tissue involvement will not be there this is also a correct statement and she may need tre uh, treated with systemic corticosteroids yes the drug of choice in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is steroids a trial of antifungal therapy will not be helpful is a wrong statement right this is a wrong statement now why we should give antifungal therapy if you take the exact picture of this patient since 6 months right since 6 months the symptoms whatever are there that has become more severe that has become more severe and intermittently she is having fever and as well as flu like symptoms why is that that is because of increase in the activity of your aspergillus right that is because of increase in the activity of your aspergillus so what you have to do recent studies have shown that combination of antifungal that is itraconazole and inhaled steroids they may be effective treatment so in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis the recent studies what they have been shown is along with steroids you should also give itraconazole and your allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis it is a hypersensitivity reaction because it's a hypersensitivity reaction the eosinophil count is elevated right because it's a allergic reaction the eosinophil count is elevated right so now you see here very simple see what is the only take home message take home message is in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis it is not just steroids which are required in active cases of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis 
you should also give antifungal treatment or antifungal agents so that is the take home message of this particular clinical question right if you know that point then this question is not at all a difficult question if you don't know that point then this question will be a very difficult question okay right so always whenever you see a clinical based questions first of all don't get a scary feeling in your brain that is the first important thing which will make you to opt for a wrong answer that is the first that getting scared itself will make you to answer incorrectly so please don't do that right so our main basic motto is to see that you should be very much thorough in answering all the clinical based questions in your upcoming fmg exam so that is the reason why these particular clinical based sessions are being conducted separately so please don't miss this sessions and you inform to your friends also that you should not miss these sessions just attending the theory classes is not just useful right i have also been tell, uh, teaching you the theory classes in your arise medical academy but only theory classes will not be useful in your upcoming fmg exam you should listen all these clinical based sessions image based sessions they are the one which are going to give you your 150th mark this clinical based sessions are the one which are giving which are going to give you that 150th mark right okay yeah yes time is definitely a very big factor uh, sai tarni but uh, really a little helpless situation hmm? we have, uh, only thing is we need to practice more and more clinical based questions so once you practice more and more clinical based questions then it doesn't become uh, very difficult for your exams okay so it is only like practice practice is the one which will make you perfect right so try to practice as many as clinical based questions wherein you will be able to catch the diagnosis immediately once you are reading the clinical based questions in your exams right yeah this is another very good question a child with mental retardation and skin rash on cheek was subjected to ct scan the diagnosis of the child is tuberous sclerosis sturge weber syndrome von hippel lindau ataxia telangiectasia yes any one of you <clears throat> a child with mental retardation and skin rash on the cheeks was subjected to ct scan the diagnosis is so you can see what is there on the patient's nose and as well as the cheek and you also have some lesion here so what will be the diagnosis okay so sesi murugan has answered it very good sesi murugan the answer is tuberculosis hmm? the answer is tuberculosis but can anyone identify what is this image <clears throat> what is there over the face what is that lesion called as so this particular lesion over the face it is called as adenoma sebaceum so adenoma sebaceum right very good monica swami so adenoma sebaceum where is that you will have classically you will have this in patients with the tuberous sclerosis right and the ct scan it is showing a big lesion and that particular big lesion it is obliterating the ventricular system right it is obliterating the ventricular si system and what is this lesion it is nothing but a subependymal nodules 
right it is nothing but a sub ependymal nodules and these sub ependymal nodules they are seen in case of tuberous sclerosis right they are seen in case of the tuberous sclerosis okay right now yeah in case of sturge weber syndrome what is that you will have in sturge weber syndrome you will have the presence of the port wine stain so that is the point which is against your sturge weber syndrome right and you take the other options like von hippel lindau syndrome see von hippel lindau syndrome very important is it will be associated with the cerebellar hemangioblastoma right they have the presence of the cerebellar hemangioblastoma where in case of the von hippel lindau syndrome then you take this ataxia telangiectasia in ataxia telangiectasia mainly these individuals they will have cerebellar manifestations ataxia is a very very important feature in case of ataxia telangiectasia right so which is not given in your clinical question so we will rule out that so the answer here is tuberous sclerosis right so this is your adenoma sebaceum and this is your sub ependymal nodules right this is your sub ependymal nodules okay right <clears throat> right this is another very interesting question and i can i can tell this a little easy question also but and let me see how many of you can answer this so we have a 19 year old man right we have a 19 year old man he is recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus and attends your clinic to ask about the possible complication in the future right so what is the diagnosis he is a type 1 diabetic now what is he worried about what is he concerned about he mentions an uncle who has end stage renal disease due to poorly controlled diabetes and specifically inquires about the testing for early signs of renal involvement right early signs of renal involvement the most appropriate investigation is right the most appropriate investigation is blood pressure microalbuminuria uh, microalbuminuria serum creatinine serum electrolytes urine dipstick for glucose right very good so uh, so we have chamu who has answered it correctly and monica also answered it correctly excellent so in diabetes mellitus what will be the early signs of renal involvement that is your microalbuminuria right microalbuminuria okay now can anyone tell me what is the quantity of albumin to call it as microalbuminuria what is the quantity of the albumin to call it as the microalbuminuria now let me tell you the entire story of albumin in the urine normal albumin in the urine that can be present is less than 30 mg per 24 hours whereas you take microalbuminuria microalbuminuria we use it when the albumin levels are 30 to 300 mg per 24 hours and we use the word macroalbuminuria when the albumin levels are more than 300 mg per 24 hours right when the albumin levels are more than 300 mg per 24 hours then we use the word macroalbuminuria right and you take the quantity of albuminuria in case of sorry uh, proteinuria in case of nephritic syndrome in nephritic syndrome the quantity of the proteinuria is around 3 grams per 24 hours 
and whereas you take in case of nephrotic syndrome in nephrotic syndrome the quantity of the proteinuria is more than 3.5 grams per 24 hours right more than 3.5 grams per 24 hours that is what you will see in case of nephrotic syndrome right so this is and if the question is asked like what is a normal total proteinuria if the question is asked what is the normal total proteinuria normal total proteinuria is less than 150 mg per 24 hours right less than 150 mg per 24 hours okay so this is a story of your proteinuria normal albuminuria normal total proteinuria when do we call microalbuminuria when do we call macro what will be in nephritic range and what will be in nephrotic range now what is that which will tell you early sign of renal impairment early sign of renal impairment will be microalbuminuria right microalbuminuria now can anyone tell me what will be the drug of choice what will be the drug of choice in microalbuminuria so remember the drug of choice in microalbuminuria is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors right ac inhibitors right now what is the mechanism of action of these ac inhibitors what these ac inhibitors will do is ac inhibitors they will reduce the intraglomerular pressure right they will reduce the intraglomerular pressure that is the mechanism of action of the ac inhibitors right so by reducing the intraglomerular pressure that will reduce the proteinuria right that will reduce the proteinuria okay right so this completes the discussion of a question related to your proteinuria right and in diabetes mellitus what will be the early change that will be in the form of microalbuminuria so your diabetic retinopathy sorry diabetic nephropathy it is the one of the microvascular complication in diabetes mellitus one of the microvascular complication is diabetic nephropathy right now we will see the next question yes yeah very interesting question and let me see how many of you can answer this a 14 year old boy present with bilateral foot deformity on examination there is presence of thickened peripheral nerves and there is also sensory gait ataxia is noted right and on biopsy of the nerve typical onion bulb appearance is noted right typical onion bulb appearance is noted the probable diagnosis of this patient is 999 tenso it is not frederick's ataxia don't jump uh, please read the question thoroughly and completely and then answer and just seeing the image don't jump on to the answer you should not be in a hurry at all right so it is not frederick's ataxia very good so now vinith kumar yadav has answered it correctly so very good so what is the answer charcot marie tooth disease right very good nagadikshita so the answer is charcot marie tooth disease so charcot marie tooth disease you will have the typical onion bulb appearance hmm? they'll have typical onion bulb appearance of the nerve on biopsy like can anyone tell me what is this foot deformity yes what is this foot deformity anyone of you can anyone describe what is this foot deformity so 
so the food deformity whatever is being mentioned here it is your pescavus right now where is that pescavus you will have let me tell you this pescavus can also be seen in frederick's ataxia can also be seen in case of the charcot marie tooth disease but but the point like typical onion bulb appearance on the biopsy that goes in favor of your charcot marie tooth disease but not frederick's ataxia right and some of you in the beginning uh, tenso chandra right you did not read the question and directly answering the question based on the image right but the answer is not frederick's ataxia here so the answer is c charcot marie tooth disease so the take home message from this question is that don't be in a hurry to answer without reading the question completely without reading the options completely so take home message read the question thoroughly read all the options thoroughly then you answer the question okay so this is a very important take home message regarding this question now if you take this charcot marie tooth disease it's a hereditary disorder right it is a hereditary disorder and this is the most common cause right this is the most common cause of hereditary neuropathy hereditary peripheral neuropathy okay so the answer to this question is the charcot marie tooth disease right next so in charcot marie tooth they will also have concomitant sensory deficit hmm? that is what is your hereditary sensory neuropathy yeah this is another very interesting question and let me see how many of you can answer we have a 75 year old women yeah it is both sensory motor sensory more predominant than motor but sensory motor will be there yes sai karni yes so if you see the next question we have a 75 year old women present with progressive memory impairment and her son says that she behaves like a child with uncontrollable laughing right with uncontrollable laughing or crying and is found her sitting in a puddle of her urine gait abnormality is present ct scan was performed what is the diagnosis so what are the points number 1 progressive memory impairment that is one point number 2 her son says that she behaves like a child with uncontrollable laugh or crying and he found her sitting in a puddle of her urine gait abnormality is present what does the ct scan shows what is the diagnosis normal pressure hydrocephalus parkinsonism dementia with levi bodies bin swanger disease see i will just tell you what is that imaging in the ct positive points in the ct the positive points in the ct is if you take the ventricles they are abnormally dilated ventricles so if you see this ventricular system so it is like abnormally dilated you will not have this much dilated ventricles in a normal ct brain so the ventricles are abnormally dilated yes very good tenso so tenso has answered this question correctly the answer is normal pressure hydrocephalus right so it is in your hydrocephalus where you will have enlarged ventricles hmm? where you will have that enlarged ventricles okay so this is a case of normal pressure hydrocephalus now the points against your binswanger disease because one of your option was binswanger disease i will try to compare both and i will explain you okay so the ct image shows dilated ventricles and favors the diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus or the binswanger disease 
or Biswanger disease. Now, what are the points in favor of your normal pressure hydrocephalus? The points in favor of normal pressure hydrocephalus is dementia, right? Memory impairment is there, right? So memory impairment is one of the point in favor of your normal pressure hydrocephalus. Gait abnormality is another point in favor of normal pressure hydrocephalus. So what is our patient having? The patient is also having gait abnormality. And our patient is like, what is she doing? She is sitting in her puddle of urine. Why? Because she also has urinary incontinence. So these are the points in favor of the normal pressure hydrocephalus. Dementia, gait abnormality, urinary incontinence. So these are the three points that tells you that the individual is having normal pressure hydrocephalus. Now the question is, why is not this Binswanger disease? Let me tell you, in patients with the Binswanger disease, they will have hypertension. But our patient is not having hypertension. It is not mentioned. So it is not mentioned means obviously we will take into consideration that the patient is not having hypertension. So that is the reason why it is not your Binswanger disease. Hmm? That is why it is not your Binswanger disease. Okay, right. Now, coming to the, yeah, okay, fine. Yes, so you take the next question. The last, another two questions, that's all. Right, another two questions, that's all. The following fundus finding is seen in retinitis pigmentosa, multiple sclerosis, Hysterical blindness, intracranial space of pain lesion. Yeah, yes, cytherny. Normal pressure hydrocephalus very commonly seen in elderly individuals. Very commonly seen in elderly individuals. Yeah, another five minutes. Chakri Kumar, another five minutes, I'll wind up the class. Right? I know that you have the class at 7:30, right? At 7:30, you have the class, if I'm not wrong. No, no. Yes, very good. Sasi Murgan has answered it. So the answer is intracranial space of pain lesion. Right? Intracranial space of pain lesion. Now, why? Why is it like intracranial space of pain lesion? Let me tell you if you see, this is the image, right? This is normal. This is the normal fundus examination. This is your normal fundus examination. See, in the normal fundus examination, you will be able to make out that the veins, whatever are there, and arteries, vessels. So this will be your optic disc in the center. And here, this will be your arteries. Vasculature can be made out easily. Vasculature can be made out easily. Now, whereas, see, this is your optic disc. You have a beautiful optic disc where the margins are very clear. You are able to make out the margins in a normal uh, fundus examination. But if you see the margins here of the optic disc, the margins of the optic disc here are, right, the margins of the optic disc. In this fundus examination, if you can make out, they are completely blurred. Right, they are completely blurred. Blurred margins are there of the optic disc. So, if there is blurred margins of the optic disc, remember, where will you have blurred margins of the optic disc? In conditions wherever there is raised intracranial pressure. Right, wherever there is raised intracranial pressure, you will have the blurred margins of the optic disc. Now, in the options which are given to you, in intracranial space of pain lesion, you will have raised intracranial pressure. And because of this raised intracranial pressure, the margins, whatever are there, you are able to make out, they are completely blurred. Right, the margins, whatever are there, they are being completely blurred. Okay, so this is about a case of intracranial space of pain lesion. So, what is the take home message from this question? 
the take home message from this question is in intracranial space occupying lesion wherever there is raised intracranial pressure the margins of the optic disc will be blurred only one point that's all right in this question take home message is only one point okay next yeah this is another very important question and this is the last question right this is the last question so in another 5 minutes i will just wind up the session okay so we have a 6 year old child with port wine stain mental retardation and recurrent focal seizures all are true about the condition except optic nerve cupping tramp track appearance on the x ray skull vagal nerve stimulation and hemangioblastoma sorry hemangioma yeah so first of all you tell me what is the diagnosis of this child with the image shown to you first of all what is the diagnosis yes nagadeekshita what do you think is the diagnosis yes sai tarni what is the diagnosis so diagnosis in this patient is sturge weber syndrome so why you should think of sturge weber syndrome right why you should think of sturge weber syndrome so if you see the stain here in these individual this particular stain this is your classical port wine stain right this is your classical port wine stain and in patients with the sturge weber syndrome they will have mental retardation and they will also have recurrent focal seizures and for the recurrent focal seizures okay and what will be there in for the recurrent focal seizures you should do vagal nerve stimulation right and tram track appearance will be there on the x ray skull and optic nerve cupping is also there in the individual question is asked is except none of you have seen except right none of you have seen except right you have seen that port wine stain okay sturge weber syndrome chalo over tram track appearance on the x ray skull everyone started answering b and everyone started answering c but the answer here is hemangioma so hemangioma will not be present right it is not present in case of the sturge weber syndrome okay so i said you in my previous question only right in i have said you in my previous question only that please don't be in a hurry please don't be in a hurry while answering the questions right so the tram track appearance will be there on the x ray of the skull right tram track appearance will be there on the x ray of the skull right so choice b is correct due to the presence of intracranial calcification so because of this intracranial calcification the x ray will show the tram track appearance right and even this tram track appearance can also be seen even in the ct scan as well correct right? can be seen even in the ct scan as well now choice c that is vagal nerve stimulation is also correct why vagal nerve stimulation is correct because the individual will have refractory focal seizures so refractory focal seizures what is the treatment you need to do vagal nerve stimulation right you need to do vagal nerve stimulation right and what is the differential diagnosis so what are the other conditions where you will have this port wine stain is in case of clippel trenone weber syndrome right in clippel trenone weber syndrome and as well as beckwith wigman syndrome right beckwith wigman syndrome so these two syndromes please remember number one clippel trenone weber syndrome that will also in that condition also you have the port wine stain where over the extremities and as well as the face and there will be also hemi hypertrophy of the soft and as well as the bony tissue that is your clippel trenone weber syndrome where you have the port wine stain next one is beckwith wigman syndrome there also you have the facial port wine stain but in beckwith wigman syndrome you have macroglasia you have omphalocele you have visceral hyperplasia right you have visceral hy hyperplasia so for your sturge weber syndrome triple trenone weber syndrome beckwith wigman syndrome 
these are the differential diagnosis for your port wine stain right for your port wine stain right and i'm telling you multiple times please don't be in a hurry while answering the questions read the question completely read the options completely right and i have seen nagadikshita right i have just shown the slide immediately she answered like tram track appearance of the x ray skull right so please don't be in a hurry please don't be in a hurry while answering the questions right hmm? so so the last question what is the take home message port wine stain mental retardation recurrent focal seizures take home message sturge weber syndrome and what will be the uh, treatment they will have recurrent focal seizures that is the reason why you need to do vagal nerve stimulation and why they will have tram track appearance of the x ray skull because of the calcification and they will also have optic nerve cupping so this finishes the topic of the sturge weber syndrome so with this i will wind up this particular clinical based sessions and image based sessions and i have said you previously also now also I'll, let me repeat this again along with the theory classes along with the theory classes you should listen these clinical based sessions these clinical based sessions are going to give you 150th mark please don't neglect it now after the exam if you regret that will be of no use whatever the efforts you have to put you have to put your efforts in understanding this clinical based sessions now itself now after writing the exam on december 10th or december 4th i think right you should not regret at that time are we had a discussion of clinical based sessions but we did not listen that time and now uh, we are feeling very sorry so please don't regret at that moment of time put your hard work now to understand these clinical based sessions so please attend these sessions don't neglect them and definitely you will crack your upcoming fmg exam right so thank you very much and see you in the upcoming sessions that is tomorrow i have another session and depending upon your schedule whatever you are having the classes i will be flexible in with my timings and then i will keep a schedule for tomorrow so tomorrow also we will discuss for one hour right thank you very much and see you tomorrow again